This is the presentation for Module 4 for Accounting 311 Financial Statement Analysis for Global Entrepreneurs. In this module, we will discuss credit markets and the supply and demand for credit. We will explore credit risk analysis and explain how lenders use financial accounting information to make lending decisions. We will also consider how credit rating agencies assess companies' credit risk and how credit ratings affect bond prices and cost of debt capital. Last, we will describe a model that uses accounting information to predict bankruptcy. In the first learning objective, we will discuss the market for credit by describing the demand and supply of credit. Credit markets are governed by the laws of supply and demand just like markets for other goods and services. Firms demand credit for operating, investing, and financing activities. Numerous parties are willing to meet that demand, including creditors, private lenders, banks, and public debt investors. Many companies have cyclical operating cash needs. For example, companies that manufacture inventory have to pay for materials and labor months before they sell their products and collect revenue. This also is the case for retailers that purchase merchandise for the end-of-year holiday season. Because these purchases are made long before expected sales, suppliers extend credit to cover the intervening months. These seasonal cash needs are routine in nature and credit risk is relatively low. However, if cash needed to cover operating cash flows is recurring, a company's cash needs might not be temporary and the risk could be higher. In some cases, a company's need for cash can be critical and finding a willing lender can make the difference between bankruptcy and continued operations. Companies routinely require large amounts of cash for investments, including purchases of new equipment and property called capital expenditures, and for corporate acquisitions. These cash needs vary in timing and amount and are especially important for new startups and growth companies that need cash to construct or purchase their initial plant and stores. As companies mature, they settle into more predictable patterns of capital expenditures and associated financing. Companies occasionally need credit for financing activities such as issuances of debt for repayment of maturing debt obligations or repurchase of common stock. Seven years of historically low interest rates have prompted unprecedented levels of borrowing. Many companies have borrowed for share buybacks. There are numerous parties that supply both operating and non-operating credit to meet companies' demands. Trade credit from suppliers is routine and non-interest bearing. Companies apply for credit and provide the supplier with relevant financial information, which is especially important for private companies that want trade credit. Whereas suppliers can use publicly available debt to evaluate the credit risk of public companies, such information is not available for private companies. Suppliers' credit terms specify the amount and timing of any early repay payment discounts, the maximum credit limit, payment terms, and other restrictions or specifications. Suppliers often tailor contractual terms to particular customers' existing and ongoing credit worthiness. Bank structure financing to meet specific client needs and the myriad rules and restrictions imposed by bank regulators. This slide illustrates the different types of credit that companies can obtain from banks. Banks carefully assess each and every loan application. Bankers often have long-term relationships with their customers, and this relationship banking provides the bank with information needed for detailed credit analysis. Mortgages are often a company's largest debt, and mortgage lenders perform due diligence before lending. For example, a mortgage lender will verify financial information and run title searches to ensure that there are no prior claims on the property. The bank will hold the title to the property until the mortgage is paid and will foreclose on the mortgage and seize the property in the event of default. Companies occasionally borrow from non-bank private lenders when they have been turned down from a traditional bank. 
private lenders might fi fund higher risk ventures because they have a better understanding of the business or particular market segment. An alternative form of financing is leasing. Leasing firms finance capital expenditures for equipment such as vehicles, production machinery, and IT equipment. Some leasing firms are associated with the equipment manufacturers such as GMAC, Ford Credit, or IBM. Other leasing firms are independent and provide a full range of leasing services. Banks also provide leases. The leasing firms analyze the credit risk associated with the lease, bearing in mind that the leased assets are held as collateral and that some of the risk can be mitigated by tailoring the lease terms. Issuing debt securities in capital markets is a cost-efficient way to raise funds. Debt that is offered for sale to the public is regulated by the SEC even if the company's stock does not trade publicly. Companies issue short-term or long-term debt depending on the need, specific need for funding. Commercial paper is short-term publicly traded debt that matures within 270 days, which exempts it from SEC regulations. Companies use commercial paper to finance short-term operating needs. Commercial paper is issued primarily by financial companies such as commercial banks, mortgage companies, leasing companies, and insurance underwriters, although large manufacturers and retailers also issue commercial paper. To secure longer-term funding, companies issue bonds or debentures. Generally, the entire face amount or principal of the bond is repaid at maturity, and tax-deductible interest payments are made in the interim almost always semi-annually. After they are issued, corporate bonds can trade on major exchanges, but most of the trading is decentralized as dealers trade the bonds in the over-the-counter markets. Borrowers are concerned with the issuing company's ability to meet semi-annual interest payments and to repay the principal at maturity. In this learning module, we will discuss the credit risk analysis process that seeks to quantify expected credit losses to inform lending decisions. Many parties perform credit risk analysis, such as are shown on this slide. Expected credit loss is computed as the chance of default times the loan loss given default. Trade creditors typically acquire information to make credit decisions via credit applications. Trade creditors often extend credit to many customers within the same industry, making default rates highly correlated among customers. Therefore, trade creditors closely monitor information on industry trends and outlooks. Financial institutions, including banks, have access to information that managers do not release to the public. Banks can typically negotiate the loan and adjust the loan terms to fit the chance of default for each client. Public debt markets have little access to additional information and can only decide to buy or sell bonds at the current price. They depend on public information and debt ratings to make investment decisions. Credit rating agencies are similar to lenders and investors in that they assess credit risk, but they differ in several important ways. First, they have no direct financial involvement with the companies they are rating. They perform the analysis to provide a publicly available signal to lenders and potential lenders. Second, credit rating agencies have access to more and often better information than other lenders because they meet with the managers both in conference calls and face-to-face -face meetings. To quantify expected credit losses, potential lenders must first assess the chance of default. The chance of default depends on the company's ability to repay the debt, which in turn depends on the company's future performance and cash flow. Different lenders approach credit analysis with different technologies. While lenders have different information sets and use different credit analysis models, there are four common steps to determine the chance of default as shown on this slide. We will discuss each step in more detail. A necessary first step is to determine why the borrower needs the funds because the nature and purpose of the loan affects its riskiness. Lending funds for ongoing operations is riskier than lending funds to expand into a new profitable market segment. 
The nature and purpose of the loan also affect the focus and depth of the lender's credit analysis. Credit analysis must consider the broader business context in which a company operates. The nature of the competitive intensity in the industry affects the expected level of profitability. Global economic forces affect the macroeconomy in which the company operates. Government regulation, borrowing agreements exacted by creditors, and internal governance procedures also affect companies' range of operating activities. Such external forces affect the company's strategic planning and expected short-term and long-term profits. Changes in the factors shown on this slide can adversely impact companies' operating performance and cash flow and the company's ability to repay its debts. Financial ratios play a key role in credit risk analysis. There is no general agreement about the set of ratios to use to assess credit risk. Further, it is not possible to specify the correct way to calculate specific ratios. Some ratios are universally defined, such as the current ratio, but many more ratios have no unique, commonly accepted definitions. For our purposes, we compute three classes of credit risk ratios profitability and coverage, liquidity, and solvency. To evaluate the credit worthiness of a prospective borrower, creditors must forecast the borrower's cash flows to estimate the ability to repay its obligations. To effectively look forward, we must first look back. Projected cash flows are especially critical because a company must have sufficient cash in the future to repay debts as they mature and to service those debts along the way. Once we have the projected financials, we can compute the ratios described previously and evaluate changes or trends. The main purpose of credit risk analysis is to quantify potential credit losses so that credit decisions are made with full information. Recall that expected credit losses are the product of two factors, the chance of default and the size of the loss given a default. The previous section discussed how to analyze financial information to determine the chance of default. We will now consider the factors that affect the amount that could be lost if the company defaults on its obligations. When a company defaults on its obligations, creditors seek to claim the remaining assets owed. A creditor's potential loss depends on the priority of the claim compared with all other existing claims. Laws and private contracts determine the order of repayment. Companies must repay senior claims first, and the U.S. Bankruptcy Code specifies the priority of other claims. If a company is in default, it is likely that it has fully drawn on lines of credit. This means that it has no other means to raise additional cash. To minimize potential loss, lenders structure credit terms and typically include credit limits, collateral, repayment terms, and covenants. The higher the risk of default, the stricter the credit terms a lender will impose. A credit limit is the maximum amount that a creditor will allow a customer to owe at any point in time. These limits are set based on the lender's experience with similar borrowers as well as firm-specific credit analysis. Some view a credit limit as the maximum amount that the creditor is willing to lose to the customer. By carefully setting credit limits, creditors can minimize their loss in the event of default, which limits credit risk. Trade creditors commonly set low credit limits for new customers and higher limits for customers with repayment histories. The U.S. Bankruptcy Code provides some protection for trade creditors by giving them higher priority for payment of accounts payable for goods shipped to a customer within 20 days before bankruptcy. Banks set credit limits on revolving lines of credit. Banks commonly specify that the credit line will be reduced in size if the customer's credit rating falls. To minimize the loss in the event of default, creditors often secure collateral, which is property that the borrower pledges to guarantee repayment. One of the most common forms of collateral is real estate. Banks and other creditors also take marketable securities, accounts receivable, 
inventory and other personal property as collateral. Before taking property as collateral, potential creditors should investigate for prior liens. The Uniform Commercial Code helps creditors in these investigations because creditors must record their liens in a state registry. The bankruptcy laws offer some protection to ordinary trade creditors that do not routinely take collateral by allowing sellers to reclaim goods shipped within 45 days before bankruptcy to settle an unpaid balance. In assessing the loss given default, collateral will limit the amount of the loss, but amounts owed in excess of the fair value of the collateral will be lost. Also, the cost to reclaim and liquidate the collateral can be substantial, even with high-quality quali collateral. The term of a loan refers to the length of time the creditor has to repay the debt. Trade creditors offer early payment discounts to control the credit risk. Bank and non-bank financing can either be long-term or short-term, but the nature of the loan influences the repayment terms. Lenders will ordinarily want to match the length of the loan to the useful life of the asset, the period over which the asset generates cash flows. To assess a loss given default, analysts consider the match between asset lives and liability terms. Also, it is generally the case that interest rates on long-term debt are higher than short-term rates. The longer the term, the higher the chance of default, the greater the credit risk. To compensate for this increased risk, creditors require a higher return. Covenants are terms and conditions of a loan designated to limit credit risk after the loan is made. Loan covenants allow the lender to monitor the loan and receive early warnings when borrowers run into financial trouble, which helps the lender detect deteriorating loan quality. Loan covenants can also prevent deteriorating loan quality by limiting the borrower's behavior to avoid situations leading to financial trouble. Some covenants require the borrower to take specific actions, such as maintaining adequate levels of insurance on inventory, property, plant, and equipment. Others restrict the borrower from taking certain actions, such as preventing the borrower from taking on additional debt. Others may require the borrower to maintain specific financial ratios, such as minimum working capital, current or quick ratios to ensure ongoing liquidity. In this objective, we will discuss ratios that can be used to measure credit risk. Ratios are only as accurate as the numbers used in the numerator and denominator. Thus, it is crucial to begin with high-quality inputs. A complete credit analysis uses adjusted financial numbers of the highest quality. As a prelude to the analysis process, we scrutinize current and prior years' financial statements to be sure that they accurately reflect the company's financial condition and operating performance. The reason is, is that GAAP financial statements do not always accurately reflect, reflect our estimate of the true financial condition and operating performance of the company. Accordingly, before we be begin the analysis process, we make appropriate adjustments. As an example, we would adjust for the effects of having 53 weeks in Home Depot's financial statements for the period ending February 3, 2019, because other years have only 52 weeks. Some companies, such as Home Depot, use what is called a 52-53 fiscal year. They do this so that they close their books on the same day of the week within a month each year. This is commonly done by companies in the retail sector. They typically select January as the month because it coincides with the natural break in their operating cycle. Two common conventions for retailers are for the fiscal year to end on the last Saturday of January or on the Saturday near the end of January, which may mean the fiscal year ends in February. This convention results in a fiscal year that varies in length between 52 and 53 weeks, the latter occurring every four to five years. 
This slide illustrates the adjustment of Target's revenue and cost of goods sold for the period ending February 3rd, 2018, which had 53 weeks instead of 52. To adjust the sales and cost of goods sold, we multiply the reported amounts by 52 and divide by 53. We do not adjust other expenses that are measured annually, such as interest, depreciation, and gains or losses. We adjust tax expenses proportionately based on effective tax rates. There is some error with this adjustment, but the failure to adjust for the 53rd week creates greater errors. Profitability is related to credit risk because firms pay interest and repay their debt with cash generated from profits. The more profitable a firm is, the less likely it is to default on its debt. In prior modules, we discussed or described how to analyze a firm's profitability using return on equity and its components, return on assets, and financial leverage. We use this framework to analyze profitability for credit risk also. This slide shows the return on equity, return on assets, and financial leverage for Home Depot for 2017 through 2019. Return on equity is a negative amount for 2019 due to negative stockholders' equity resulting from large stock repurchases. Also, the 2017 and 2018 ROE ratios are very high for the same reason. As discussed in the prior module, one way to handle this analysis challenge is to add back the Treasury stock balance to both equity and total assets. Under this approach, the ROE for Home Depot over the three years is as shown in the chart at the bottom. ROE is in the 20% range over all three years, increasing slightly in 2019 as ROA improved from 9.8% to 11.1%. We conclude that the company's profitability is strong and sustained. The company's financial leverage is holding steady and is below 2.0, which is a reasonable level for a company such as Home Depot. A second method of ROE disaggregation distinguishes between operating and non-operating returns as we discussed in Module 3. Operating return, as measured by return on net operating assets, is an aggregate measure of the return from Home Depot's main operating activities and is a comprehensive profitability measure that is not affected by the company's leverage or treasury stock activity. As shown in the slide, RNOA for Home Depot has steadily increased over the three-year period ending February 3, 2019. These returns are high, especially compared to other U.S. retail firms. Further, this increase is due to both profitability and productivity since both net operating profit margin and net operating asset turnover are increasing each year. These increases are steady and are positive signals about cost and asset management. Coverage ratios compare company operating profits or cash flows to interest and or principal payments. We use coverage ratios to assess the company's ability to generate profit and cash to cover the fixed charges from debt in the short and long term. Although there are many coverage ratios, we will focus on some that are more commonly used as shown on this slide. The times interest earn ratio reflects the operating income available to pay interest expense and is calculated as shown on this slide. The underlying assumption is that only interest must be paid because principal will be refinanced. Management and lenders want this ratio to be sufficiently high so that there is little risk of default. Home Depot's 2019 times interest earn ratio is 14.5 compared to the 2018 ratio of 13.9, indicating increasing ease of interest payments from operating income. Earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization is a non-GAAP performance metric 
commonly used by analysts and investors. This slide shows the calculation of EBITDA coverage. Depreciation and amortization as reported in the statement of cash flows are added back in the numerator because they are non-cash expenses. The coverage ratio will always be higher than the times interest earned ratio because of the add back of depreciation and amortization. We see that the 2019 EBITDA coverage ratio for Home Depot is 16.5, a healthy ratio, and a sign that the company is able to service its debt. We will now look at coverage ratios based on operating cash flow. A company's liquidity depends critically on its ability to generate additional cash to cover debt payments as they come due. The times interest earned in EBITDA coverage ratios assume that the company needs to cover interest payments only each year because the principal owing will be refinanced. This is not always a valid assumption. To measure a company's ability to repay principal in the short and longer term, we can use the operating cash flow to total debt ratio. Companies must replace tangible assets each year to continue operations. Any excess operating cash flow after cash spent on capital expenditures, or CAPEX, is considered free cash flow in that the company is free to use the cash for other purposes, including debt repayments. The free operating cash flow to total debt ratios is argued to reflect a company's ability to repay debt from the cash flow remaining after CAPEX. Liquidity refers to cash availability, which is how much cash the company has and how much cash it can generate on short notice. Two common liquidity ratios are the current and quick ratios shown on this slide. The current ratio measures working capital, or current assets, divided by current liabilities. Positive working capital, or a current ratio greater than 1, implies more expected cash flows than cash outflows in the short term. Generally, companies prefer a higher current ratio, but a ratio of less than 1 is not always a bad sign. Some companies can efficiently operate with a current ratio of less than 1 by minimizing receivables and in inventory and maximizing payables. The quick ratio is a variant of the current ratio focusing on quick assets. The quick ratio gauges a company's ability to meet its current liabilities without liquidating inventories that could require markdowns. It is a more stringent test of liquidity than the current ratio. Long-term solvency analysis considers a company's ability to meet its debt obligations, including both periodic interest payments and the payment of the principal amount borrowed. The general approach to measuring solvency is to assess the level of liabilities relative to equity. There are a variety of ratios to gauge solvency, and I'll use balance sheet data and assess the proportion of capital raised from creditors. Two common solvency ratios are liabilities to equity and total debt to equity, as shown on this slide. The liabilities to equity ratio conveys how, re how relevant, how reliant a company is on creditor financing compared with equity financing. A higher ratio indicates a less solvent company. One drawback of the liability to equity equity ratio is that it does not distinguish between operating creditors, such as accounts payable, and debt obligations. We can refine our analysis by excluding operating liabilities from the numerator. This solvency ratio assumes that current operating liabilities will be repaid from current assets, such that lenders should focus on the relative proportion of debt and equity. As this chart illustrates, solvency ratios vary by industry. Companies in the restaurant, agricultural implement, commercial printing, and home improvement industries have a large proportion of debt. This is typically because companies in these industries have relatively stable cash flows, and they can therefore support a higher debt level. At the lower end of debt financing are companies such as newspapers and retail clothing stores whose cash flows are less predictable. In this learning objective, we will describe the credit rating process and explain why companies are interested in their credit ratings. A credit rating is an opinion of an entity's creditworthiness. 
its ability to meet its financial commitments as they come due. In the U.S., a number of firms provide credit ratings, and while each firm has its own unique rating method, they all essentially evaluate financial and non-financial data in a manner explained in this module. Credit rating agencies provide opinions about whether a particular debt security will be repaid. The types of debt securities include debentures, asset-backed and mortgage-backed securities, convertible bonds, short-term bonds, medium-term notes, preferred stock, and derivative securities. The credit rating agencies also provide ratings for specific debt issuers. An issuer rating is a comprehensive opinion of an entity's ability to meet obligations. Agencies provide issuer ratings for corporations, sovereign nations, municipalities, other public finance issuers, and derivative instrument counterparties. This slide shows credit ratings by influential rating agencies such as S&P Global Ratings, Moody's Investor Services, and Fitch for selected companies. The debt of companies with higher ratings are considered to be investment grade because they have very low default rates. Credit ratings below investment grade reflect higher possible default rates. Credit ratings are very important because they affect the cost of debt. The risk premium or the amount above the risk-free interest rate is determined by a company's credit rating such that riskier bonds carry higher interest rates. Higher cost of debt not only increase interest expense, but it could limit the number of new investment projects. With a higher cost of debt, some new projects might not yield a return greater than their financing cost. Thus, a decrease in credit rating can restrict a company's growth and future profitability. Although credit ratings are only opinions, they are influential. As shown on this chart, evidence suggests that companies try to maintain investment-grade bond ratings. The trough in the histogram provides evidence that issuers avoid just missing the investment-grade cut off. The importance of a company having an investment grade bond rating is that some investors such as pension funds will not or cannot purchase non-investment grade bonds. Companies seek large institutional investors because they trade more carefully and less frequently than individual investors and liquidity traders. Therefore, companies are averse to falling from investment to non-investment grade. Each credit rating agency has its own unique approach to credit rating. Recall that credit rating agencies have access to information not available to other lenders. Regulation FD does not apply to credit rating agencies. Typically, the agencies create analyst teams that comprise a primary analyst as a team leader and other analysts and specialists who may face-to-face -face with managers of the company being rated. This slide illustrates the approach to credit ratings taken by Moody's. Each rating agency has analysts who have a deep understanding of particular industries because risk drivers vary markedly across industries. After assessing country and industry risk, analysts consider firm-specific risk. To that end, the analyst team gathers financial statement data to compute and analyze financial ratios such as those we have discussed earlier. A list of the ratios that Moody's Investor Services uses with median averages for various risk classes is shown on this slide. In examining the ratios, recall that debt is increasingly riskier as we move from the first row to the last row. For the most part, the ratios weaken from row to row, although there are some exceptions. For example, the ratio of EBIT A divided by interest expense increases from AAA to AA. Mutis explains discrepancies such as this as follows. Qualitative and forward-looking considerations are important. When Moody's does analyze financial ratios, it uses a multivariate approach. As a result, a simple monotonic relationship between ratings and any single ratio should not generally be expected. The Credit Rating Reform Act regulates credit rating agencies. Under this law, credit rating agencies with three years of experience are allowed to register with the SEC and will be considered nationally recognized statistical rating organizations.
As of 2020, the SEC has designated nine out of nearly 100 credit rating agencies as NRSROs, as shown on this slide. The law has both its detractors and supporters. Some contend that NRSRO designation bestows a competitive advantage to certain agencies. This view is supported by the vigor with which non-recognized agencies seek NRSRO status. On the other hand, the designation might have actually increased competition by providing a seal of approval to smaller agencies. In this learning objective, we will apply bankruptcy prediction models to evaluate bankruptcy risk. Bankruptcy is a worst-case scenario for creditors. Accordingly, creditors are very interested in assessing the likelihood that a company will go bankrupt. One model for assessing a company's bankruptcy risk is the Altman Z model, which assigns an Altman Z score based on the calculation shown on this slide. Each variable is related to financial strength. The first variable provides a measure of liquidity, while the second and third measure long-term and short-term profitability. The fourth variable captures the company's levered status, while the fifth variable reflects its total asset efficiency. By comparing Z-scores of bankrupt and non-bankrupt companies, Altman was able to predict bankruptcy accurately for up to two years with 95% accuracy in the first year and 72% in the second year. For years beyond the second year, the model's predictability declined sharply. This slide shows the calculation of the Z-score for Home Depot based on the February 3, 2019 financial statements. Home Depot has a Z-score of 7.719, which exceeds the 3.0 lower cutoff for safe companies. Thus, we conclude that there is a low risk that Home Depot would go bankrupt in the short term. And this is the conclusion of the presentation for Module 4 for Accounting 311, Financial Statement Analysis for Global Entrepreneurs.